Hello class, welcome to Geometry Lesson 17, which is all about writing proofs. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to use deductive reasoning to prove theorems. So let's start out with something that you guys are fam familiar with, which would be solving problems, right? So we're going to use something familiar to learn something new. We're going to learn how to write a two-column proof. And the way that you do that is you're always, um, you start a problem with something called a given and then also a proof statement. And your very first step always, always, always in writing a proof, and yes, I know it's obnoxious to say the same word three times, but it's obnoxious not to remember to do this. So this is easy points. You start out by writing your given information, okay? So you get points simply for writing what was written down at the beginning of the problem, okay? So my first step is always to write the given. Okay, <clears throat> I'm done with that. Now if I were to solve this problem, let's just solve it algebraically and then we'll talk about the right-hand column. So if I were to solve this, I would distribute that 6. So I'd have 84 plus 6x equals 108. Then I would say that I'm going to subtract 84 from both sides. If you still want to tee it up and write it that way that we did last year, I'm okay with that. So once I've subtracted 84 from both sides, I'm left with just 6x equals 108. Next, I would divide both sides by 6, and then I'd be left with x equals 4. Okay? So let's separate each of these out. Each line that I'm creating on that right-hand side, I am going to have to fill in with a reason. You'll notice that this two-column proof has two columns. The one on the left is the statements. The one on the right is the reasons. Okay. So in that first step, we had our given. And then what changed between that first step and that second step? I distributed that 6, right? I used the distributive property. And if you want to abbreviate that to dist prop to save time, I'm okay with that. Then the next one, I subtracted 84 from both sides. So I used the subtraction property. I'm not kidding. That is literally what it is called, subtraction property. And if you want to abbreviate that, you have to include that T, okay? Because we're going to use something else that is similar to that, okay? We have something called the substitution property. So if you're, if you're abbreviating subtraction, do S-U-B-T. Next, instead of writing with the 84 minus 84, I got rid of that and I have a zero. Anytime you change something, but it, the way something looks, but it doesn't change the value, um, and you're not doing an operation, that's called substitution. Or you can just call it subs, okay? That's why that T is important and that second S is important in subs. Then I divided both sides by 6, so division property, or if you want to abbreviate it, you can just call it div prop. In the last step, instead of writing out the division, I just changed it. That is more substitution. Okay? So you solved a problem algebraically, and you write each of the um, reasons why on the right-hand side. Hopefully that doesn't seem too bad. It takes a little while to get used to, but you'll get there. Something for you to screenshot and remember is something called vertical angles. This is your theorem 1-1 in your book, but something to know, vertical angles are congruent. Okay, You need to remember what a vertical angle is, though. So vertical angle is any time you have, you see how these two lines make kind of an X? 
it's the angles that are kind of opposite each other. So like three and four are considered vertical angles. You know, they're on top and bottom of each other. But something that people forget is that one and two are also considered vertical angles because they have that same sort of relationship of being on opposite sides of that X that's formed by the lines. And it's important not only to be able to identify vertical angles, but to know that they are congruent. So our next thing, which I just kid, I forgot I had this slide. Quick refresher, complementary angles add up to 90. Supplementary angles add up to 180. This will come in handy as we go through the lesson. All right, now something for you guys to practice is writing a two column proof it, but without it being just a problem that you're solving. So this one is actually kind of um, proving what some what vertical angles are. Okay? So step one, just like when it was an algebraic proof, you start by writing your given. Step two, I'm also given a picture. If you notice over on the right hand side of the screen, I have that diagram. That's also kind of given information. So I can use information that's in that picture. And if I look, I can see that angle one and angle three form a linear pair and angle two and angle three or angle one and angle three are supplementary. And angle two and angle three are also supplementary. I know some of you are probably asking, Ms. Johnson, why don't you just say angle one and angle two are vertical angles, therefore they're congruent, because theorem 1-1 one, one tells us vertical angles are congruent. Well, that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to prove that theorem. So we can't use that theorem to prove itself, okay? So that's why I have to look at other relationships that are happening here. So I can look at this picture and I see, oh, angle one and angle three, they are supplementary. So if I were to add angle one to angle three, it should equal 180. And the same thing goes for adding a measure of angle two to measure of angle three. That should also equal 180. And that's because these are supplementary angles. Something I noticed about that second step, I see that both things are set equal to 180. So why don't I just replace, instead of writing that measure of angle one plus measure of angle three equals 180, I'm just going to replace it with measure of angle one plus measure of angle three equals measure of angle two plus measure of angle three. Okay, so instead of writing these 180s, I got rid of those and I set the other two things equal to each other. So I'm okay with you calling this substitution, but technically, if you remember what the transitive property is, it is the transitive property. If you want a quick refresher on the transitive property, that was where we said if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Okay, so we have three different things. In this case, we would have 1, 2, and then the 180 would be the third separate thing that are all equal to each other. So that's how the transitive property works. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Okay, we'll get more in depth in that a little later. You learned about that in algebra last year at the beginning of the year. So it's been a while, I understand. Okay, anyways, moving on. So we now have that measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 3 equals measure of angle 2 plus measure of angle 3. Why don't I subtract a measure of angle 3 off of both sides? So I'm just going to write measure of angle 1 equals measure of angle 2. And I know that's because subtraction property. And if I know that the measures are equal, I can say angle 1 is congruent to angle 2. That's definition of congruent angles. So 
sorry, that's an S in there. Okay, so notice I'm using a lot of shorthand. Oh, um, I'm using the congruent symbol instead of writing out congruent. Instead of writing out the word angles, I am now just switching to an angle symbol with an S, so that way it's plural. Okay. So I started with my given. Angle 1 and angle 2 are vertical angles. I looked at my picture for other relationships, and I used that supplementary information. And then I just substituted, subtracted, and ended up with two congruent angles. Okay, so let's talk about using the vertical angles theorem to solve for different things. So I have two angles that are vertical and they're congruent. That means they are equal. So if I want to solve for x, all I have to do is set them equal to each other. So if I tee it up and let's say I subtract 4x, subtract 4x, I have 2x, and then let's say I add 45, add 45, 2x equals 50. If I divide by 2, divide by 2, I get x equals 25. So that's how you would solve that problem. Why don't you go ahead and try solving this one on your own? Good luck. Hopefully you ended up at x equals 19 after you set them equal to each other. If not, be sure to ask for some help. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at is theorem 1-2, congruent sup supplements theorem. Okay, so this is basically what we just did in that last step. We have, I see that angle 1 is supplementary to angle 2, and angle 3 is supplementary to that same angle. That means that angle 1 and angle 3 have to be congruent, okay? Theorem 1, 3 is congruent complements. So the same idea but with complement, complementary angles, meaning that they add up to 100, or not 100, 90. They add up to 90, okay? So angle 1 is complementary to angle 2. Angle 3 is complementary to angle 2. Therefore, angle 1 and angle 3 have to be congruent. So it applies for supplementary or complementary. All right, now let's talk about writing a paragraph proof. So paragraph proofs are basically the same. It's literally the same thinking as a two-column proof, except you are going to use full sentences instead, okay? And the way that you start out that paragraph proof is still with the given. But we're not going to write given and then list the information. No, so you would say something using that information that we have. So I would start maybe by saying, by the definition of supplementary angles. Ooh, I'm going to leave that just where it is. Okay, by the definition of supplementary angles. I can say that the measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2 equals 180, and the measure of angle 2 plus measure of angle 3 also equals 180. Then I would look at it and say, I notice that they both have a sum of 180. So I'm going to say something like, since both sums equal 180, I know that the measure of angle 2 plus measure, measure of angle 1 plus measure of angle 2 can be equal to the measure of angle 2 plus measure of angle 3. And then I notice I have a measure of angle 2 on both sides of that equal sign, so I'm going to subtract measure of angle 2 from each side of this equation to get the measure of angle 1 equals the measure of angle 3. And by the definition of congruent angles, I can say angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. Notice that I finished this paragraph proof using my prove, I'm actually going to use the other color, using the prove 
statement. So here is my proof. And then all of this was my given. And the stuff that isn't boxed is just those calculations that happen in between that given and that proof. But even if you don't know what that middle step should be, if you start your paragraph proof with that given information and end it with that proof statement, you get some points. You get some credit because you show, you're showing me that you know the rough outline of a paragraph proof. Okay, let's talk through just a couple more theorems. These might seem a little silly, but theorem 1-4, all right angles are congruent. Okay, that seems self-explanatory, right? If you have a question about that, please ask me, okay? Um, theorem 1-5, if two angles are congruent and supplementary, then each is a right angle. Well, supplementary means that they add up to 180. Congruent means they have to be exactly the same. The only way to be exactly the same and add up to 180 is for both of them to be 90 or right angles. Theorem 1-6, that's a linear pairs theorem. So the sum of measures of a linear pair is 180. Okay, We know that there's 180 degrees in a line. And then the transitive property, this is taken out of your algebra book actually. Uh, so if one quantity equals a second quantity, and the second quantity equals a third quantity, then the first quantity equals the third quantity. So that's, I kind of showed you something like this um, a couple slides back, but it might help to see this last box. If 6 plus 9 equals 3 plus 12, and 3 plus 12 equals 15, then 6 plus 9 must also equal 15. Okay, so you can see that there's three different ways to write it, and um, that is called the transitive property. And our very, very last proof, okay, um, we want to write a two column proof with the given information. So I start out by writing down all of my given information. All right, now that I've written down my given information, I want to look and see what else do I know. Well, I know the measure of angle 1 equals the measure of angle 2. The measure of angle 1 equals 105. So that means I can say that the measure of angle 2 equals 105, and that would be another example of that transitive property. Now that I know that the measure of angle 2 equals 105, there's not a whole lot more in that written out given. But if I look at my picture, I can see, oh, hey, angle 2 and angle 3, which I'm trying to get something about angle 3. Angle 2 and angle 3 form a linear pair. So I'm going to say angle 2 and angle 3 are a linear pair. And I know that just by definition of a linear pair. And what else do I know about a linear pair? I know that they have to add up to 180. And the reason I'm going to go that way, I can see that my proof statement involves numbers. So I want to change from, that, from the words to numbers. So measure of angle 2 plus measure of angle 3 equals 180. And that was our linear pairs theorem from the last page. If you haven't taken a screenshot of those already, I recommend rewinding and doing so. Okay. Now that I've added them together to equal 180, I also know what the measure of angle 2 is already. So I'm going to say 105 plus the measure of angle 3 equals 180. And that is just called substitution. I just swapped out a number for measure of angle 2. Then I can subtract that 105 from both sides and I'm left with the measure of angle 3 equals 75 and like I said I subtracted oops, subtracted from both sides so this is just the subtraction property. Okay, So step 1, write the given. Step 2, try to use the given information to come up with another step. Step three, 
look for a picture, see if there's any more given information from the picture, and then, you know, take a look at that prove statement. Where are you trying to go and how, um, how do you get there? So I saw, okay, from the picture, I saw a linear pair, but my proof statement had numbers, so I had to change it from being a verbal linear pair to having numbers. And then I just started swapping out some other things that I had already found in order to get to that final proof statement. Okay, proofs take a lot of practice and a lot of patience and usually some frustration in order to get to the point where you need to be. Remember to stay calm, ask questions, whether from a peer or myself, and we will get there, okay? Have a great day.